Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, at this time, I'd like to ask all in council chambers to turn off or at least set their phones uh, on vibrate. Uh, today is December 4th, and the public hearing of the Stratford Zoning Board of Appeals will come to order to hear those petitions advertised for this session. Uh, for those of you not familiar with our process, each petitioner or their designated representative will present their case to the board. When they have concluded, board members will then have an opportunity to ask any questions they may have. I will then ask if there is anyone who wishes to speak in favor or in opposition to the petition. We ask that all petitioners uh, come to the microphone and speak clearly and directly into the microphone. Uh, state your name and address. After all petitions have been heard, we will then uh, recess to our administrative session. Interested parties are welcome to stay. However, only board members and staff will be allowed to speak at that time. Please be advised that clapping or shouting as a way of expressing opinions on applications is not allowed or tolerated. And let us begin. Good evening, Ms. Young. Would you be so kind to uh, read the first item on our agenda? That would be. Then yes, I will. <laughs> 350 Whipperwill Lane, petition of Shana Wolf seeking waivers of section 3-3 and section 3.3.1, excluding 3.3, 1.2, 3.3, 1.9, 3.3, 1.10, and 3.31-11, to construct a single family dwelling in an RS-1 zone. Hardship, pre-existing, non-conforming, irregularly shaped property. Madam Secretary, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Habansky, ladies and gentlemen of the Board of Zoning Appeals, my name is Nicholas Owen. I reside at 4 Whipperwill Lane here in Stratford, uh, basically a stone's throw from this property located at 350 Whipperwill Lane. Uh, I am going to try to be as brief as I possibly can. Uh, we had an extensive public hearing on this particular petition two months ago and for numerous reasons up to and including there wasn't a full contingent of members in October and the election kind of fouled up uh, November's hearing. We are here again this evening. I stand to be corrected by Mr. Habansky, but I think where we left off is that we continued the public hearing that uh, based on, it could have been my suggestion or it could have been a suggestion of Ms. Young that based on verbal information from me that I received from the fire department that there were no issues with the right of way, the way it was laid out, what we were going to do to enhance it, that everyone felt that a piece of correspondence from the uh, fire department from Mr. Lambert was appropriate. I believe that Mr. Hobanski has an email from Mr. Lambert, and I will read it. It's brief into the record. And that was generated on Tuesday, September 18th, and it says, Hi, Jay. I have reviewed the proposed site plan sent on 9718 for the property known as 350 Whipperwill Lane. Also, I took the liberty to visit the site with the applicant so that I can get a clear picture of what is proposed. My initial concern, however, that we would be able to get the fire apparatus up the driveway or the right-of-way to the existing large home that currently is there. Mr. Owen and I discussed this matter at length and ultimately he agreed to better the driveway from its current condition and provide a reasonable width as proposed on the site plan. Now, the site plan that Mr. Lambert is speaking about is the site plan that was presented to this commission uh, in September. So he wanted to review it. We took, as the letter indicates, we went out, we took a look at it. He was satisfied. I would like the commissioners to keep in mind there already exists on the top of this hill, which is serviced by this right-of-way, a very large house. A very large house. I'm sure some of you or all of you have been out there and you know exactly what I'm what I'm speaking about with regard to that issue. So I can submit, I'll be happy to submit this letter into the record as evidence. There were also um, a number of other issues that were raised by uh, Attorney Schofield, who was an absolute gentleman, uh, even though he is opposed to this. And those issues, most of those issues involved the wetlands issue which we sought and received approval for. That is all we had to do. We didn't have to have a permit in the hand to come to this commission to seek approval. All we had to do under the 
statutes or under the uh, issues with the town of Stratford is receive approval. And I did submit a copy of that wetlands approval into the record. However, I do have an updated version from uh, Tina, the wetlands administrator. And it, what is important for the commission to, um, to take judicial notice of, not that this commission is the wetlands commission, it's the Board of Zoning Appeals Commission, and we are simply here seeking a waiver to build a home. The scope of the work, this permit is for the site plans approved for May 17, 2017 at the regular meeting of the Windlands, Wetlands and Watercourse Commission and includes the configuration and layout of the structures as indicated on the approved plans and documents as well as those all identified, permitted and regulated activity. The site plans and documents are based on this approval. So we have approval based on the site plan that was submitted, which is the exact site plan that was submitted to this, to this board, the Board of Zoning Appeals for approval, and I'd like to submit this updated uh, permit, updated approval into the record. It's not the permit. My concern is that a majority of the comments from the opposition were based on the fact that Mr. Hirsch, who was sitting right here, did not seek to take out a permit or post a bond and commence the work. Now, not to belabor this point, but at one of the hearings, the first hearing, uh, Mr. Hoydick asked a specific question on why that permit was not established as of yet, and why it wasn't pulled, and why the work wasn't done. And some of you may remember my comment. My comment to Mr. Hoydick, who was very unhappy about it, was that I was not at liberty to speak with regard to that. It was a personal issue. But Mr. Hirsch, who was here this evening, I told him I'd like to answer that question since it was, to me, may not be an integral part because this is, again, not the Wetlands Commission, but there is a reason. Mr. Hirsch is a contractor in the heavy equipment business and got run over by one of his pieces of equipment about nine months ago and still is limping. He has not worked for a period of nine months. I'm sorry. I thought you were shooting at me. He had not worked for a period of nine months, and in fact, he's here tonight. He can testify to that, but you can take me at my word, that's exactly what happened. It's not an excuse. It's not something that you should feel sorry about, but I wanted to have that question answered. And Ms. Baytog, the wetlands administrator, is fully aware of that. <coughs> to get down to the nitty gritty, and I know you guys are concerned about the hardships. The hardship, based on this particular instance, as indicated in the application in my testimony in September, we have one on a regular piece of property in a one-acre zone. That's a hardship. We have a piece of property in a one-acre zone that doesn't have street frontage consistent with the zoning regulations. That's a hardship. We also have a situation where this parcel is impacted by wetlands. It is impacted by the upland review area. Therefore, at least 50% of this lot, according to the wetlands regulations and according to the approval from the Wetlands Commission, is untouchable. The learned attorney, Mr. Schofield, pointed out in one of his presentations that, well, this house is going to be located 35 feet away from the rear property line. That's true. The zoning regulations in an RM1 zone specify that you must be at least 35 feet on a side yard, 40 feet from a rear yard, so many feet from the front yard, so many feet from the side yard, a certain configure of the house has to be built on that property. And in this instance, based on the impact of the wetlands and the upland review, it's a hardship to place that house four square on that property to meet the regulation. Therefore, we requested a waiver of that. I'd like to point out that Mr. Schofield's house and every other house on Nutmeg sits on a one-acre lot. Mr. Hirsch's property is on a one-acre lot. Nutmeg, where Mr. Schofield lives and other people that were concerned and stood up and opposed the petition, live on one-acre lots. They all have 
35 foot side yards, 40 foot setbacks, 40 foot from the street. This is no different than any other properties up there other than the fact that we are impacted by a situation on a larger piece of property that has a right of way which has existed since 1928 and in fact they called it Wood Road. Why did they call it Wood Road? They called it Wood Road because they used to mine wood out of there. It was a farm. They planted, uh, they planted corn and uh, soybeans or whatever they planted back in the days up on that property. However, that is no reason not to approve this petition. The hardships are inherent on this piece of property. They're not self-created. It's an irregular piece. And in fact, I think I pointed out to the commission and showed, and I don't have the board here, I think the board is part of your exhibits. There's only one other property in the north end of town like this. And that happens to be down the street from this particular property between where I live on 4 Whippoorwill Lane and this property at 350 Whippoorwill Lane. And it's a four lot subdivision. Same situation, has a right of way to two houses and back irregular piece of property, not enough street frontage, impacted in the rear, <clears throat> excuse me, of that property by high tension wires, which you have to keep so many feet away from building. So this is not a unique situation where the board cannot see their way clear that a hardship, that har many hardships exist on this, but it should not prohibit this board from approving this for a one family, for a one family home. I point out to the commission that Connecticut General Statutes 6, uh, excuse me, 8-6 allows zoning boards of appeals to grant variance from zoning laws when conditions affecting a particular parcel would create an exceptional difficulty or an unusual hardship in the absence of a variance. Well, if any parcel or any petition came before this board that fits four square into that law, it's this particular petition at all. It also states section 86 allows ZBA to grant variances from the zoning bylaws, ordinances, or regulations with respect to parcels of land when owning to conditions especially affecting such a parcel, but not affecting generally the zoning district in which it is situated. A literal, a literal enforcement of the laws, ordinances, or regulations would result in exceptional difficulty or unreasonable hardship. In making the decision, the ZBA must consider public health, safety, convenience, welfare, and property values. The applicant must show that the variances will not substantially affect the municipality comprehensive zone plan, and that's found in DuPont versus Zoning Board of Appeals, Town of Manchester, 80 Connecticut, Appendage 327, 2003. Sancudas versus Zoning Board of Appeals, Town of Wallingford, 66 Connecticut, 2001. Smith versus Zoning Board of Appeals, Town of Norwalk, 174 Connecticut, 323-1978. The reason why I cited those cases, those are all similar situations where there are specific hardships to the property, to the land, that would prohibit any other building other than if it were granted a waiver such as this. This is unique. This is a one acre lot in a one acre zone. There are one acre there are one acre lots surrounding this whole property. In fact, most of the north end is one acre zone. And what I can do, and I will submit this map into the record. This is a map of all the zoning districts in Stratford. You can see by it that one family resident districts RS, RS1 <coughs> and Pink RS1 district. This is the entire one RS1 district in the north end. What I have colored in red is this particular piece. It sits right in the center of a one acre zone in a one acre district. All we are asking is that the board grant us a, the waivers requested to build a single family home in a one acre zone that meets all of the side yard setback requirements with the exception of those waivers requested in our application. What I'd also like to point out to the commission, and I'll conclude very shortly, that whenever the Board of Zoning Appeals, and I'm not here to preach the law, you've heard it, and I'm sure you're going to hear a petition tonight, at the, uh, probably at the very end, where the court has remanded it back for the board to make the proper findings in order to grant the waiver or deny a waiver. 
and that is simply whenever a zoning board of appeals grants a variance, it is required to state the reason for its action. It is not enough for the board to state that there is a hardship. The record must support a finding that there was an unnecessary that there was unnecessarily hardship or practical difficulties, particularly affecting the premises in question. And I submit to this commission over and over again. This certainly is a situation where this is a peculiar property. It is off the street. It is a right of a legal right of way that's existed since 1927. This entire parcel with nine or ten acres in there it pre-existed any zoning regulations and certainly pre-existed the change in the regulation on rear lot re uh, revised regulations in 1985. I would like to submit this into the record and I have outlined the outside of it in pink as to what I just read into the record. I brought along with me the Stratford on the Housatonic Plan of Conservation and Development which was formulated in 2013. And in this particular book, it's the Comprehensive Plan of Development for the Town of Stratford. This happens to be on page 52. Residential districts, and it designates all the residential districts, and this particular piece of property is in residential district one on a one acre lot, and it's an approved use to build a single family house on a one acre zone. We're not seeking to build a two family, we're not seeking to build a duplex. We're seeking to build a single family house in a single family zone. I don't think I have to submit this into the record. I'm sure you guys have all seen this, but I wanted to point that out to the commission. Now, what I like to say is that if I have said anything that you don't understand or you have a question, I would like to hear about it because once you close this public hearing, I don't have an opportunity. I have to sit there and keep my big fat mouth shut even though I think somebody has said something that's not exactly what I meant or what I said. So if I've missed something or someone has a question, I would be more than happy to address that question or those issues at this point. I thank you. Anybody but yes, any, Young. anybody but Miss Young. Good evening. <laughs> Good evening, Miss Young. Uh, forgive me if you've already stated it, but it would help me to clarify it. Sure. When I read the agenda item, it talked about your seeking waivers to construct a single-family dwelling. Does that mean that both you and the town of Stratford? identify this as a separate legal building lot and now we're just talking about how could it be developed? What, what we are saying in the way this particular piece would work, and I'm glad you asked that question. This is a three-step process. First step process according to town regulations, even though there is state law contrary to it, is that we should go before the Wetlands Commission and seek wetlands approval. Not only did I do that at the Wetlands Commission, I wanted to make sure that I was guiding Mr. Hirsch down the right paths since this was a very contentious wetland petition, as Mr. Hoydick would recall. Um, we went into it in great depth, depth. I also laid out the septic system. According to the health department, we have health department approval. We laid out the drainage according to the engineering department. We have comments from the engineering department, Town of Stratford, Mr. Casey, as to things that he would like us to see at the intersection, if you're kind enough to approve this, where this particular right-of-way meets Whippoorwill Lane to alleviate an ongoing forever drainage pro uh, problem off the entire hill. That's the first step. But we took it further. Engineering approval, health department approval, no comments from the police department, fire department approval, Septic system approval. Second step, to appear before your commission to see if we can get waivers granted. If that happens, then our next step is to go into the planning commission for a resubdivision. Now, why is this a resubdivision? It's a resubdivision because there's already a big blue house on top of the hill. That was the first free cut. You only get one free cut, so the rest of it has to be subdivided. I hope that answers your question. Let's make sure it does. 
if I heard you correctly, no, it is not a separate legal lot now because you need these variances to allow you to appear before the planning board who can then grant you that status? That's correct. Thank you. I have a second question. Sure. Uh, I don't know if this is still relevant, but on August 24th, Jay Habansky wrote a memorandum uh, where he discusses, should the proposed application for variances be approved, the following conditions of approval could be attached, and he itemizes three of them. I can hand this to you if you want to be reminded of what I'm referring to, but I'm wondering if these are still relevant and whether or not your client accepted these conditions <coughs> if this were to be approved. We accept them, and we you're, have accepted them. You're familiar with them? Yes, I am. Uh, no other questions. Thank mm -hmm. you. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from the board? Seeing that none, uh, thank you for your presentation. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to ask in the audience if there's anyone that would like to speak in favor of this petition. Seeing none, is there anyone who would like to speak in opposition of this petition? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Name and address, please. My name is Edward Schofield. I reside at 140 Butternut, which is an abutting property to the uh, one under consideration today at 350 Whippoorwill. Um, I'm going to try. I know you have a busy agenda tonight, and I'll try to be brief because I, uh, I know we spoke at some length last time, but there are a few points I think that bear uh, noting. Uh, with respect to Mr. Owen's comments tonight, uh, he made reference to Nutmeg. Obviously, I think he was referring to Butternut Lane, which is the property on which three of the abutters live at 110, 140, and 160. Um, uh, the fact that those are one-acre lots is completely irrelevant. They're not uh, rear lots. Uh, they don't. They have frontage. They don't implicate the provisions that require uh, this applicant to come before this board seeking the numerous variances at issue. Therefore. That's not a relevant consideration. Uh, yes, there was a lot of discussion about wetlands. I haven't seen Ms. Bado's updated, um, I'd like to see it. I haven't seen this, uh, was submitted today by Mr. Owen. Uh, I, I think the, the point, the simple point on wetlands, rather than belaboring it, because it's really not the grounds for opposition. The grounds for opposition is that this is not a proper case for a variance. However, by way of background, we did go into some detail about the wetlands. The point now, is that uh, for more than two and a half years, there's been no effort to remediate this property since the cease and desist was issued in April of 2016. Uh, Mr. Owen, uh, as I mentioned last time, during the April 27th, 2017 meeting of the Wetlands Commission, uh, according to the minutes stated, uh, this application, meaning the wetlands application, has to go before the, the ZBA and the Planning Commission. He noted the first step would be the restoration. Two and a half years later, nothing's happened. Uh, with respect to the, uh, uh, Ms. Young's comment, with respect to, there was a long-winded answer, but I think the answer finally came out, which is no, it's not a building lot. It's not a building lot because there was an illegal division of the lot, there was a combination, and then there was a division. And it was not approved by the Planning Commission, therefore there is no building lot at this time. With respect to um, a couple other very specific points, uh, this is, I finally had a chance after the last uh, hearing to get into the uh, uh, zoning department and to review the file. So a few comments, because I hadn't been provided with copies of these documents, but a few comments about the documents that have been received before this uh, body as exhibits in this proceeding. Uh, one of them would be exhibit, uh, draw your attention to exhibit seven. Uh, it's important to note that exhibit seven, which purports, it's a letter addressed to Mr. Wilson and Barbara Ede and Shelton relating to um, the Whipple World Lane property. Uh, it's a little confusing. This is, what this is, it's a document created, I guess, on a word processor where you have a letter, but then interspersed with the original letter, you have comments by a third party. There's no provenance or authenticity or authentic authentication of the document other than what it appears to be is excerpts from a letter from Gary Lortonson, who was Mr. Herbansky's predecessor in the administrative role for the town of Stratford for the zoning board. And in that letter to Mr. Wilson and Ms. Ede, Mr. Lortonson, again, you have to review, there's, there's bold type, which I believe, the, the board will be the judge of this, is Mr. Lortonson's wording. Obviously, I would hope that Mr. Habansky might be able to put his hands on the actual public record 
which would be, would, would obviate any uh, hearsay concerns. It would be an admissible consideration for the board to consider. The other document is unclear the, you know, who the author of it is. But I want to make sure that it's, it's, it's ob that it's known, that the committee knows that this writing was not all Mr. Lortonson's work. That I believe the bolded portion is his work and then someone is writing protesting uh, his conclusion. So I wanted to make that point. And then another document which I didn't have an opportunity to review until uh, after last uh, hearing in September, uh, and there was some allusion to it a moment ago by Mr. Owen, and that's Mr. Habansky's report uh, dated August 24th. Uh, and Mr. Habansky, apropos of Mr. Um, Owen's comment a moment ago, where he, he cited the, the board, and, and it's belabors the point, you folks are more familiar with it than I am, to uh, General Statute uh, Title VIII, Section 6, which empowers the board to grant variances. Um, and rather than um, a source of support for this application, I think the statute and the cases interpreting it are a very clear indicator that a variance is not appropriate in this case. Why? Because as Mr. Habansky notes in his report, this approval of this particular uh, application requires no fewer than the granting of seven variances because of a number of, you know, the, um, the placement on the lot, the setback requirements, which are, of course, on a rear lot are greater than 35 feet, uh, the frontage issue, the driveway width, all those which are cited in the application and also detailed quite uh, exhaustively in Mr. Habansky's report. The law on variances is it's a power that is to be sparingly exercised, sparingly exercised according to Reed v. ZBA, 235 Connecticut. So rather than supporting, it seems to me the law actually uh, countermands uh, approval of this uh, application. Three other quick legal points. One, um, we've heard about hardship. Uh, the law is very clear. Proof of exceptional difficulty or hardship is absolutely necessary as a condition precedent to granting of a variance. A mere economic hardship or a hardship that is self-created is insufficient and neither is a financial loss a proper basis. A number of cases, Bloom v. ZBA at 233 Connecticut, 198, many others. The point being that here, as we established last time, given the history of this lot, given the history of the lot where there was a combination and then an illegal subdivision, because the owner stands in the shoes of the predecessor in title, he is, takes the title subject to that uh, self-imposed hardship and therefore is not uh, a proper applicant uh, for a variance. And the corollary doctrine is um, the taking of knowledge rule. There was uh, uh, evidence last time Mr. Wilson stood up and spoke and he uh, shared with the panel, he was the seller um, of this parcel originally. Uh, to the uh, uh, owner who then transferred it, as I understand it, to, uh, to, to uh, Mr. Hirsch, uh, Mr. Hirsch's uh, spouse. And the point being that it was stated clearly before the body, this body that Mr. Hirsch took title with knowledge, with knowledge of the zoning impediment. And the law, again, the law is clear that under the law, uh, that's a specific subspecies of self-imposed hardship. If a purchaser acquires property with knowledge of the applicable zoning regulations and later attempts to use that property in a manner which is prohibited by the regulations, the purchaser is barred from obtaining a variance. Citing among other, among other cases, Abel 172 Connecticut 286, Devaney 132 Connecticut 537, Mandacini 50 Connecticut Apple, Appellate 311, and Kelamian 65 Connecticut App 628. In summary, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is again, the wetlands is an interesting backdrop and it certainly doesn't support the applicant's position here, but it's not determinative. What's the determinative is the application for variance which does not meet the legal strictures that this board is obligated to apply. Thank you. Thank you, Leadership. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to speak in opposition? Um, seeing none. Is there uh, any rebuttal? Last word. There is absolutely no question that this is a legal hardship. I have pointed out several instances where this lot based on the fact of where it's located, how it is situated, the impediments 
based on the wetlands and the upland review absolutely qualify for a variance. The learned attorney is trying to confuse the issues not because of the fact that Mr. Hirsch wants to build a home there, but because of the fact that Mr. Hirsch turned around and clear cut all of the review areas that you can see in color here. He went before that wetlands commission, and I'm not going to belabor it again, and got approval to restore the wetlands, got approval to put the septic system in, the drainage, and do everything and anything he needed to do in order to conform to bring us to this point. This board, Board of Zoning Appeals, has a clear legal right to approve it. Keep in mind that the only area that we can use and the way this house is situated is based on the impact of the wetlands and the upland review area and the way that the right of way wanders up to this house and ultimately up to the blue house on the top. We are before the proper board first. We went to the wetlands, numero uno, Board of Zoning Appeals, proper board, then the Planning Commission in order to create the subdivision. That's how it's done. Irrespective of the fact that this happens to be an off-the-street lot, anyone can come in with an eight or nine, ten-acre piece of property and come before the Board of Zoning Appeals and request waivers of whatever they're seeking waivers for before they go to the Planning Commission. Then they have to, just like we do, go in front of that Planning Commission to get subdivision approval. This is no different other than this is a unique piece of property that has issues that require us to come before this commission. And I implore you to approve this petition because I think it's the right thing to do. And I thank you for your time. Would you uh, like this in the record as an exhibit? That is your choice. I'd like to put this into the record as an exhibit. Okay, let's put it off on the side. We'll find a way to get and this, it. And this is your exhibit, Jay, that I borrowed from you from last time. <coughs> Okay, uh, the next item on our agenda, if uh, Ms. Streets would read in uh, to the record, item number two. Oh, I'm sorry, do I, uh, do I have a motion to close the hearing for 350 Ripple Lane? Motion to close. Made by Ms. Young, seconded by Mr. Tavares, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, item number one is now closed. This is for 7476 Warwick Avenue. Petition of Emanuel Franceschi seeking a waiver of section 3.11 to construct a two-story, <coughs> two-car garage incidental to a two-family dwelling in an RS1 zone. Hardship, narrow lot, pre-existing zoning, not enough space in yard for one-story addition, therefore need to build a second story above garage. Hi there, Mr. Owen. For the record, again, Nicholas Owen for Whippoorwill Lane, Stratford. I'm here tonight acting on behalf of Emmanuel Franceschi, who lives at 74-76 Warwick Avenue here in Stratford. And part of your application process is to send out mailings, and I have for the uh, record a copy of the receipts and a copy of the correspondence that went out with those <coughs> mailings. Mr. Franceschi has owned this property for many years, and the, uh, the improvements at 7476 Warwick Avenue, uh, based on the variance of this and relief from the provisions of Section 3.11 from the zoning orders, require more than 10, no more than 10 feet height of the structure in an RS4 zone. The variance is minimal, necessary to overcome hereafter the enumerated exceptional conditions as the lot is 10 feet narrower than the minimum allowed, therefore the petitioner has limited space on which to build and needs to build up. Now, in your packet you have a survey, and I think your survey is marked up in blue and red, such as this one, so you can look at this as I'm going through it if you would like, and you can see that Mr. Um, Franceschi's house is sitting approximately 28 feet from the street, 
and his garage is to the rear of the property, and it has a side line. If the variance were granted of 10 feet on one side and 6.8, which is existing on the other side, and has 19 feet to the rear, uh, rear of the property. Now, if, if you people are familiar with Warwick Avenue, it is a mixture of one family and two family homes. Uh, at least one variance has been granted in the past. Not that it's something that you have to lean on if you so choose to approve this, but one variance has been granted in, in the past to raise a single story on the garage and create a two-story garage. Now, the purpose of this is so that Mr. Franceschi can eliminate all of the clutter and the material that he has stored <coughs> on the first floor of the garage and get some of his vehicles uh, off the driveway and off the street and into the yard. It, it, there's no question it's a busy street. There are no, no parking signs in that, in that neighborhood. Uh, people park in their driveways, they park in the street, but Mr. Franceschi needs this additional space in order to store some of his uh, belongings. And what I would like to submit to the board at this point in time is a copy, <laughs> is several pictures depicting what is currently stored on the first floor of the garage that he would like to move to the second floor of the garage. And I'd like to present these one, two, three, four, five pictures into the record as an exhibit. That depicts what is currently in that first floor of the garage right now on which he'd like to move his vehicles in. I also have several pictures numbered one through four, uh, one through five, I'm sorry, that depict the current condition of the garage and what is laying outside on the property that he would <coughs> like to move some of those items into the garage and clean up his yard so he can better serve his family so they can use their yard as legitimately a yard instead of a storage facility. And I'd like to submit this into the record as one exhibit. Those are pictures one through five. We took a look at several different options to increase the first floor size of the garage, which would take up more ground area and therefore create a situation where he doesn't have as much yard as he has now. And we felt that we should come before the Board of uh, Zoning Appeals and ask for a waiver to put a second story on. The sole purpose of the second story is to store materials, not living space, <coughs> store Thank materials. You. Uh, to eliminate some of the clutter. Now, Mr. Habansky pointed out in some of his comments that um, he didn't have a, um, a scale of the height of the garage and the height of the addition. I'd like to submit those into the record as part of the record this evening. Thank you. There are other properties, uh, the board should be aware that there are other properties in this neighborhood that have second stories on their garage. However, they are attached. This happens to be detached. Now, the story, the um, garage next door, actually, let me back up a bit. <coughs> Mr. Franceschi, for a concern of his neighbors and the neighborhood, and they all get along great in this neighborhood, went around to all of the adjoining neighbors and to those who live across the street and got letters of support for this petition, and I'd like to submit these into the record. Not one person that I am currently aware of uh, that surround Mr. Franceschi is opposed to this particular addition to his house. In fact, this neighborhood is pretty well kept. Everybody gets along with each other, and we would just like to keep this and remodel this garage so it is consistent with the rest of the neighborhood and give Mr. Franceschi the storage that he needs. Uh, there was a petition on September 4th for uh, 2018. Uh, the same thing for section 3.11 to construct a two-story two-car garage in an RS1 zone and this board did in fact approve it. And I point that out uh, just to let the board know that this is nothing unique. Uh, there, from time to time you do take a hardship into consideration and this would be a hardship if Mr. Franceschi was not able to, um, to achieve this variance. I would also like to submit into the record 
a, um, a copy, a letter from James A. Dennison, LS, who did the survey on this property, and I asked him to do a height uh, measurement of those properties and those garages that uh, the closest to Mr. Franceschi's property, and uh, I'd like to enter this into the record as an exhibit in support of this petition. And with that, unless the board has questions, what I would like to do is end it by saying, uh, or end it by uh, referencing Mr. Habansky's remarks of October 19, 2018, where he indicates that this may be inconsistent with the existing character of the surrounding neighborhood, <coughs> and there are no other homes on the street that have two-story detached garages. That is true. But it's not inconsistent. We don't find it inconsistent with the neighborhood because if you look at the neighborhood, it's a mixture of one or two family houses and there are other garages, although, as I previously indicated, are attached to the dwelling. In this case, because of the narrowness of the lot and the smallness of the lot, to spread out further on the property, as I indicated, would be a detriment for his full enjoyment of the property. And, and with that, I... Um, I conclude my remarks, and if there's any questions, I'll be more than happy to try to address those issues or questions. Um, board members, any questions? Mr. Hoydick? Yes, just a couple questions. Uh, just to clarify, the footprint that exists now is going to be the footprint of the new structure. Accepting therefrom, Mr. Hoydick, Take a look at your survey. This little area right here, so we can put a stairwell in up to the second floor. However, that is well within the side yard requirements. There is no waiver requested for that. It would be to the northern end of the lot. I see that. So then, in other words, that's going to be an exterior stairwell to get to the second story? Interior. Oh, there's no exterior? There's no exterior stairwell at all. <coughs> okay. As a matter of fact, if you take a look at one of the drawings, you can see how the lap, uh, actually, the picture, the black and white picture, yep. you will see how dilapidated the outside looks, and he wants to bring all of that into conformity so it looks as good as the rest of the neighborhood looks. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Young? Uh, since you brought up Mr. Hibansky's October 19th letter, uh, if I could direct your attention to the last paragraph. You had mentioned the narrowness of the lot, and in the last couple of sentences, Mr. Hibansky states, uh, the height of the accessory structure does not appear to be constrained as a result of the existing lot width. If the applicant intends to use the second floor garage space for storage, it would be more appropriate to propose an addition to the principal structure and seek a variance for lot coverage. Then there would be a nexus between the undersized lot, the addition, and the potential hardship. I'm we, not, we looked at, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to say I, I'm unaccustomed to Mr. Habansky offering alternative approaches. I encourage all applicants to look at alternative approaches, and I look forward to hearing what you did with that suggestion we, d we did look at that in fact as part of my presentation a few minutes ago I indicated to you that the reason why he did not want to build it on the ground level or widen or add it to the house is that he wanted to have the ability to have room to have a yard and have his family play in the yard that's why we went up instead of out and over so back to the language in the very last sentence, the nexus between the undersized lot, the addition, and the potential hardship. Uh, in a recent case, maybe 15 minutes ago, you were citing case law telling us what our job is and what, where we can find hardship having to do with the unique conditions of a piece of property. I want this, I want that, or not reasons I heard you recite of what can be reasons for granting a hardship or a variance. So could you restate again why this alternative uh, could not be done as it relates to the land, not the desires of the landowner? Because what it would do, as Mr. Habansky stated in it, it would require us to come in for a waiver of, um, let me find it in here. I 
don't see it right off the top of my head. Um, Are you looking at the lot coverage? I'm, look, I'm sorry, I'm looking for lot coverage, yes. It would require us to come in for a, a waiver of lot coverage. And our alternative to that was to go up on the existing structure instead of increasing to the rear of the house or adding to the ground floor of the garage and therefore decreasing his, the, the owner's, Mr. Franceschi's, ability to use his yard as it was intended to use. And keep in mind, there have been other waivers on that street under the same condition except they were attached. So it's not unique that we're going up a second story. But you also described uh, we don't need to take into consideration what has been granted down the street. That's the correct. The focus is on what's being proposed this evening. But I point that out uh, so that you take judicial notice of what has happened. I did hear you. Thank you. However, uh, again, I think the statement Mr. Hrabanski made was trying to draw a relationship between the variance sought and the hardship offered. And I think the point he was making that resonates for me is that there is a relationship between lot coverage and the narrowness and the undersized part of the lot. It's hard for me to make the connection between going up as it relates to the width and the narrowness of the lot. Except I would be seeking a waiver for a different situation then. One that I might support. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Mary. Any other questions? Yeah, yes, Ms. Owens. Um, sure. Again, looking at the October 19th uh, staff review report about that second story uh, possibly being used for an illegal housing uh, apartment, what kind of guarantees could that be? Should the owner move away and somebody else moves in? What I'm at, what I'm looking for is uh, what future considerations that would be. You could certainly, if you decided to approve it, which I hope you do, you could stipulate that it not be used for human habitation. Now, keep in mind, uh, Mr. Tavares, what can happen here is if, let's say that he comes in, the board has a right to hear that petition, has a right to grant or deny it, as the board would in any other situation, any other place in town. Now, does it become a situation where uh, the zoning enforcement officer may get involved? Yeah, there are certain situations where the zoning enforcement get involved, but that's his job. But there, is no, there are no plans to use this as human habitation. The per sole purpose is, is to use it as storage. Thank and you. free that ground floor up so he can get some of his vehicles in. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Mr. Owen, I have a question along that same line. I want to, wondering if you or your client would share with me what utilities they are planning on bringing to the structure once construction starts. I think all he, all he currently has there is electricity. Yes. Um, yes. Um, there, there is Come up here, please. State your name for the record. For the record, my name is Emmanuel Franceschi for 7476 Warwick Avenue, Stratford, Connecticut. Um, again, sir, um, already existing in that unit, uh, there's a half bathroom with sewage, incoming domestic water, and a, a sub panel already that carries 220 volt and also 110. Um, previous to that, um, in the side of the garage, as illustrated in the black and white picture where the vehicle is parked, there was a carport, and that carport was falling apart. Um, we, we removed it for safety reasons. And, uh, and as I have Mr. Nick Owens re represent to me, um, as he's familiar with most of the land surveying and uh, all the request <coughs> measurements um, to get the permit or um, variance approved, um, that's what's currently existing in that unit. Um, but again, it is used for storage, it's used for my vehicles. Um, the neighbors in that area, there were, their main concerns were um, parking. We have a lot of issues with the um, train station here with parking. If, uh, if I may say, if we do expand outward in the garage or uh, in the land there, we're gonna have problems because those cars wouldn't be able to no longer be in the driveway because I will have to put my lawnmower, snow blower in that lower area, um, which I'm having a difficult time as of now bringing it to the, to the garage as a seller because I have to put ramps and it's dangerous for me to get hurt and stuff like that. So it's been a big inconvenience, and I do want to remodel that garage because it's kind of falling apart along with the I market. drove by it, yeah. I should point out to the commission that the facilities that you had questioned and that he just enumerated to you were there when he bought the house. It's nothing that he put Right, in. right. Um, and uh, as a follow-up question, and I, and I apologize, I don't have my set of prints with me. Um, the front elevation of the garage, is there a door 
accessing from the exterior of the second floor stairway, or is it from inside of the garage? From the, it's going to be from the outside. So they're outside, so somebody can walk from outside, walk up the stairs, there's a wall there, and into right. the garage. Yes. Or second floor, excuse me. Right. And okay. into the garage. Okay, and an access into right. the garage. Interesting. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? There being none, uh, I'd like to entertain a motion to close the public hearing on 7476 Warwick Avenue. Anybody you got it? Oh, oh. oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. I jumped ahead. <clears throat> My bad. Is anyone here to speak in favor of this application? Seeing none, is there anyone here to speak in opposition of this application? Seeing none, now I will entertain a motion to close the public hearing for Warwick Avenue by Mr. Hoydick, seconded by Ms. Streets. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Carried unanimously. <coughs> um, Mr. Hoydick, would you please read the third item on our agenda? Into the record. Sure. Item three, um, 361 Keenan Road, petition of Anatole Quindro seeking a waiver of 4.2 regarding the side setback minimum, height maximum, and 14.2 to permit the expansion of a non-conforming use via a rear addition incidental to a three-family dwelling in an RS4 zone. The stated hardship is pre-existing non-conforming location. I'm sick of listening to me tonight, believe me. <coughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Nicholas Owen for Whippoorwill Lane here in Stratford. I'm here this evening again acting on behalf of Antolo Quendro. Quendro. Mr. Quendro has, um, is an immigrant into this country a number of years ago and currently works at uh, Sikorsky's as an electrical engineer. He owns this particular property at 361 Canaan Road uh, for a number of years, and it's a three-family home. It's a pre-existing, non-conforming three-family home. And if you will, if you have been by it lately, it is an absolute disaster. It had a major fire that destroyed pretty much the house, although uh, it can be rebuilt. It's not a teardown. It's less than, uh, it's 40, 42, 43 percent damage, but it requires just about everything. And part of the everything, Mr. Quandro would like to add an addition on the back, and you can see where it's located. It is located on the side of the property that shows the distance to the property line of 3.4 feet. Now, it is 3.4 feet from the property line on the existing structure. So what he would like to do is in putting this addition on the back, is keep it consistent so everything is a straight line back. Why does he <coughs> want to do it there? He wants to do it there because he doesn't want to tear down the two-car garage on the other side and put that addition on that side. And besides that, the, the purpose of this addition is not only simple to increase the size of that room. There was a small room in there that is seven feet wide. The fire department indicated to him once he starts construction, he will have to meet all of the new fire codes, which simply mean he has to meet the fire codes in the house for a three-family house. He has to meet the fire code for the width of the stairway <coughs> and how that stairway is built and how it should be fireproof. So if there is, God forbid, another disaster, people can get in and out of there. You will see that this property goes from Canaan Road to Benjamin Street. It has plenty of square footage. The issue here is to allow Anthony, Antle, or Anthony, to rebuild it and put this addition on the back and have it conform with the existing, the existing sideline. Now, as part of the application property, and again, I'm ahead of myself, the um, part of your process is to send notices to all of the adjoining property owners and I would submit these receipts into the record along with a copy of the letter that was sent to them.
Mr. Habansky, in his comments on October 19th, 2000, excuse me, 2018, the proposed application is for a parcel located in RS4 zone. The district is residential in nature, consisting primarily of residential dwellings. The applicant is seeking variances in 4.2 regarding the side setback minimum, height maximum 14.2 to permit the expansion of a non-conforming use due to a fire to subject location. The legal use is a three-family dwelling as verified by the Stratford Zoning Enforcement Officer. The first waiver request is regarding the site setback. The existing home location does not comply with the mini minimum 10-foot setback. And instead of me reading that all into the record, I pretty much enumerated why he wants to do what he wants to do. Now, the height variance is in order to keep the exist to match the uh, proposed addition along with the fire code stairwell to the existing home roof line so it all looks like it belongs there and doesn't look as if it were just uh, not thought through and thrown into it. The petitioner has cited specific hardship being pre-existing non-conforming location. The authority to grant the variance may be used with respect to the parcel of land having unusual conditions and not generally encouraged within the zoning district. That would make the development in full accordance with the regulation. This would be extremely difficult for him to meet the regulation because he would end up having to tear down an existing two-car garage, which is in good shape, which he uses, and move this over to here, which makes, does not make any logical sense. Therefore, that's why we are requesting this waiver. I believe I previously submitted with the application a copy of all the deeds that are associated with this property. The current building and use does not conform with the existing regulations, and the reason why it doesn't, this pre-existed prior to zoning being enacted in the town of Stratford. So we think we are in front of the proper board seeking this waiver, and we think uh, I think this is a good proposal. It would meet everybody's needs, and I think um, everyone would be happy if he can get this project underway and refurbish that house and bring it up to compliance with current building regulations. And with that, if there's any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Are there any questions from the board? Seeing none, thank you, Mr. Owen. Thank you. Is there anyone in... Uh, here to speak in favor of this application? Seeing none, is there anyone here to speak in opposition of this application? Seeing none, I entertain a motion to close um, the public hearing for 361 Canaan Road. Mr. Tavares, seconded by Ms. Young. All in favor? Aye. Carried unanimously. <clears throat> Mr. Tavares, would you be so kind to read item number four on our agenda? Absolutely. 16 Goodwin Place, Petition of Habitat for Humanity of CFC, seeking a waiver of Statute 5.112, requiring 5,000 square foot per dwelling unit to construct a two-family dwelling in an RM1 zone. Hardship being lot area requirement per unit was recently changed and proposed development is in keeping with the block. Good evening, Commissioners. Um, Kevin Moore, I'm the Director of Construction with Habitat for Humanity of Coastal Fairfield County. Um, I'm gonna submit my mailings. Thank you. Um, we're an affordable housing builder. Uh, we cover Coastal Fairfield County, so from Stratford to Greenwich. Uh, we build low-income housing, um, and we sell those homes to deserving families with 30-year interest-free mortgages. Um, we've completed over 220 homes uh, in coastal Fairfield County since our inception in 1985. About 20 of those units they are here in Stratford. Um, the vast majority of them are right next door in Bridgeport. Um, we, so generally what we do is we take blighted vacant lots um, and we, if there's an existing structure, we'll demolish that structure, we'll build a new home, uh, keep our costs as low as possible using volunteer labor and as much donated material as we can get. And then we sell those, those homes with 30-year interest-free mortgages. Um, our homeowners have to make between 45 and 65% of the area median income um, to qualify for our program. 
we acquired this lot, uh, 16 Goodwin Place, from the town of Stratford. Uh, we demolished uh, existing dilapidated abandoned home on it. Um, and we're now left with this lot, which is uh, a bit unusual in the fact that it has 100 feet of frontage, but only eight, 80 feet of depth. Um, so what we're proposed is uh, a two-family home. We think it's in keeping with the, the nature uh, of the neighborhood. Uh, but it does not, does not meet the um, unit area requirements for the zone. Uh, I've brought a few photos from the neighborhood with me. I can point those out to you. Um, so this is the existing structure that we tore down. This is our current vacant lot. Um, immediately across the street is an existing three-family home. Um, and next door is a... Uh, <coughs> what appears to be a two-family, but it's in fact a single family with an in-law. Um, there's also a number of multi-families further down the street um, on the Surf, Surf Ave end of the road. The very end of the street is a commercial development. So it's kind of an unusual area, um, and it's, it's kind of an unusual lot as well. Um, so uh, we feel that the proposed uh, two-family will have uh, no detrimental effect on the neighborhood. It'll be very much in keeping with the aesthetic of the other buildings on the block. Um, and it'll give us the ability to serve two deserving families uh, in need of um, the opportunity for home ownership. Of course, that's what the town, the town hoped to do by, by working with us to provide this property. Um, so I'd be happy to answer any questions if are there any questions? Any questions? Ms. Young? I have a question for Mr. Hubansky. I'm looking at your uh, staff comments dated October 19th, and near uh, the end of the bottom of page one, I just want to make sure I'm understanding the statement where you say, the subject lot did not comply prior to the text amendment in <coughs> 2014, and does not comply currently. If you could <clears throat> expand upon what you meant when you said it did not comply in 2014. Th that was the date of the lot area requirement per unit. So I, I should have been more clear that that was referencing the cited hardship by the applicant. Um, the applicant, I believe, stated the hardship as being the lot area requirement per unit was recently changed and the proposed development is in keeping with the block. So that statement, it didn't comply, this lot and the house didn't comply, um, wouldn't have complied prior to 2014 or after. That's what I meant to say. Thank you. I, I assume that's what you meant, but good to have it on the record. Uh, Mr. Moore, having heard Mr. Hermansky clarify that in his opinion, uh, the text amendment really had no impact upon what could be done at this site with relationship to how many units. Do you have any other hardship argument you'd like to supplement your application with for consideration? Um, yeah, actually, I, I overlooked, I actually was intending to answer, respond to a few questions laid out in Mr. Havansky's um, memo as well, which maybe I could do after this. Um, there's, there's four questions laid out in the that might be informative to the board. Um, uh, so what I was referring to in the application may, I may have been unclear, but it appeared to me that at one time in this zone there was a 3,750 square foot per unit requirement. So I, I guess what I was attempting to suggest was that at one time the proposed two family would, um, would meet the, the requirement in that we have 8,104 feet which would have been in excess at the time of the 7,500 square foot um, requirement. I think maybe a, a more compelling hardship would be the unusual shape of the lot. Um, the, the lot exceeds the necessary frontage. It has 100 feet of frontage. So we feel because of that, but because of the, the somewhat uh, shallow lot depth of 80 feet, that the street appearance of this, uh, of this home would be very much in keeping with the aesthetic of the neighborhood. Um, can I respond to those four questions that are laid out in Mr. Hamansky's? 
I think we would all benefit from hearing your sure. responses. So uh, the first question is, uh, will there be one owner of the entire property or each unit have an independent owner? Um, so when we build, when we build, we always sell each unit to, its, to a, an individual owner. Uh, because we're building for low-income families, we don't want to burden them with the, uh, you know, the challenge of being both a first-time homeowner but also a landlord, as that these homeowners are oftentimes living um, very, you know, close to the edge in terms of uh, income. So yeah, we would be selling each unit to a different, o different homeowner. This would help the homeowners in that they'd have a bit of support network. They'd also have uh, spread the some of the costs of home ownership, taxes, things of that nature between, between the two unit owners. Um, all owners are required to live on site. That's part of our, our mortgage requirements. So uh, our, both units will be owner occupied. Uh, the next question is, given the rock ledge outcrop in the southwest corner of the lot, the lawn area in the rear will be minimized. Is there an anticipation for the ledge to be removed and the entire rear to be loamed and seated? Will the lawn be shared by all on site tenants? So I, I guess I would respond to that, first of all, by, in fact, they'll be on-site homeowners because they, they won't be tenants. They'll be actual, the two unit owners. Um, our intention is to remove as much of the ledge, uh, as much of the ledge as possible, you know, within confines of cost. We are going to clearly have to remove some of the ledge if, if this approval gets, um, if this application gets approved to make way for the, the structure. We'd like to remove as much as, as, much as possible um, and provide as much lawn area as possible. And all that lawn area would be in common ownership, essentially, for the, for the two unit owners. They would share uh, that property. Um, will a shed be installed, question number three, will a shed be installed to hold lawn mowers and other home maintenance items? Um, that seems like a reasonable request. We'd be happy to accept that as a condition of approval if the board felt that was uh, reasonable. And then finally, uh, item number four, a decorative window or architectural feature should be considered for the street facing gable end unit uh, number one and the east facing gable end unit number two to improve the overall design aesthetic. Uh, again, you know, we're building affordably as, as possible, so we're trying to keep our costs down as much as possible, but by the same token, we're very much interested in making uh, all, of our, all of our development bolster the the aesthetics of the neighborhood so we'd be we'd be happy to take that as a condition of approval as well if the board thought that reasonable i'd be happy to answer any other questions thank you any other questions from our board a follow-up question to mr herbansky in item number three of the memorandum of october 19th were you asking the question about the shed for potential storage of lawn maintenance equipment because you were recommending that should be considered? Well, you know, I, I'm not 100% sure as to what the formula is for Habitat for Humanity, so it was really more, I don't necessarily think it's a, it's a must, but I thought there was something that we may want to, the board may want to hear what, what they typically would do or maybe they don't do. That's it. So they have adequate lot coverage to support a shed if Yes, I think they're only at 26%. Uh, let me just double check. Yeah, I believe that's correct. 26%. So there's more than enough to do two 100 square foot lawn sheds. Thank you. Any other questions from our board? Seeing none, I'd like to thank the applicant and ask those in attendance if anyone is here to speak in favor of this application. Okay, is there anyone here to speak in opposition of this application? Please state your name and address for the record. The name is Atanasios Papastavros. Okay, hold on. We're going to have to probably spell that for the record. I, um, I border to the south of this property. I'm on Hickey. Uh, I saw some of the paperwork that they have submitted in, in removal of the stone or ledge or whatever, but it didn't show no details how that was going to be removed. Uh, my house is built on that ledge. Three quarters of my home is, is on that ledge itself. 
<coughs> all my, my septic is there, my leaching fields are there, my garage is built on it. So there's no details in how, how that's gonna be removed. Mm -hmm. Now, from my understanding, that was that was zoning on that property was changed back four four years ago or five years ago. I know. That you needed X amount of feet for that lot to be. I think you're referring to the the text amendment in 2014 that requires 5,000 square feet per unit for okay. a multifamily. Correct. Now, does that property have that? No, it does okay. not. Okay. That's why they're they're here applying for that waiver. Okay. Of well, that you know we gotta we gotta make it into you know what I'm saying. I mean I I can understand if they tried to put like a a single duplex there, then we wouldn't have this thing. But we still need to know how they're planning on removing that ledge because that's quite a bit of ledge there. And uh, my neighbor here is board, borders that property also. And. Uh, is 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 just you know they the the play the place w when they bought that in i believe it was 2016 i mean there was so much garbage and stuff over there that nobody even cared about all these creatures and everybody over there were, which was never closed up boarded up and that garbage stayed there for like two years until they demolished it in in january of 2018. So that's not pretty kosher, you know, on their behalf to come in over here and put two family house, two single family houses on, on one single lot. You know what I mean? But that's what, I, that's what I'm here about because my house is built on that ledge. I, three quarters of my house is on that ledge. May I ask you a question? Yes, sir. Uh, and I'm not a contractor, but they built a CVS across the street for one of my properties Yep. And I'm pretty sure that the if there's any blasting that is done, and I'm not sure, we'll ask the applicant their intentions, uh, that seismologists come out and survey the adjoining properties, take pictures of foundations, and I think they do things like that. I'm not sure, but my question to you is this. If you were, if the applicant were to satisfy you or you were satisfied that it was done, you still oppose this application because you don't want a multifamily dwelling, well, is I that just correct? Don't, I just don't want no, no problems with, with my property because my property is built on that ledge. That okay. ledge goes all the way to- I understand. The, the, the ledge goes all the way to two boots, all I, the way past that. <coughs> I probably, saw it. Yeah. Right? I, I saw mean, it. The, the, the whole transfer station that, that was all blasted on, on, on Stratford Avenue. That's a long way. Right? That's the, <laughs> sa that's the same vein. Okay. You know, that, that, that vein might go all the way up to West Broad Street for crisis. I really don't know. Okay, thank you. Know, you know what I mean? Hello, I'm Jason Hello. Penn. I live on 65 Goodwin. Right, I bordered a property. To the right? Yeah, if you look properly to the right. Okay. Yep, the one where they said two family, but it's actually one family with in-law. I am pegged into that <coughs> ledge. I don't oppose them. They're, they're more than welcome to build it because it'll just up that whole value of the street. The problem is, is I am pegged to that ledge for my entire building. Mm -hmm. So what reinsurance do we get if something happens to our property while they're blasting or jackhammering? Because I know 100% when I was dug, I pegged to that ledge for the entire addition. And it was a monolithic pour, so that means it's 100% on top of that ledge. Mm -hmm. Just the picture of our house isn't, doesn't really show that John DeLeon, sorry, Everybody's just to check that in. See where this field was? The ledge passed this from here, as you can see here. That is probably 10 feet towards our house. Where our driveway would end here, the ledge is right there. Yep, so when, probably four feet high, 10 feet in from the property. Yep. When I dug, I hit the ledge from here <laughs> all the way over. <coughs> I couldn't get footings, so I had to peg it literally right. to that rock. I just want to know what reinsurance are we getting when they go to blast or 
however they're going to get rid of that rock that's not going to damage our homes. Yeah, attack our foundation. Right, that's a valid concern. Yeah. Really on, on the that's the only issue I really have with the whole thing. Besides, it did take them a year to clean up that lot all summer that was overgrown, and they did nothing to it until finally they want to now do something. And I came down to the town and complained about it plenty of times because I live next to it. I had my house on the market. Every single person that came there looked at that lot and said, what's going on with that? Not a one person made an offer. For a year and a half, my house was on the market. Not a one person made an offer on it. So I just want to know what reinsurance we get from them with blasting. or Because they said blasting. The paper we have, they said they want to blast. And I don't know if they realize that we're all on that ledge. Okay. So, thank well, you. thank you for your input and your concern. It's noted. May I add something? Um, I noticed that, um, I don't know, I'm, I'm from Trumbull or, you know, even Bridgeport or whatever. When, when something is modified on, on a partial like that, is it supposed to be posted? You mean, is this hearing supposed to be posted? I mean, I mean they're, trying, they're trying to modify the, the zoning, right? Right. <clears throat> is that supposed to be posted there? Yes, and it was posted. It was posted? <coughs> yes, it was. All, all the postings are done by, by town staff. By town staff? When was that? Let's see. It's usually done, let me see, I've got to look at the calendar. would have been posted the 27th of November. I, I went by there on the 24th and nothing was there. I went by. Well, it wasn't it was posted, posted on the 27th. Beg your pardon? It wasn't posted. 27th it was posted. It, it, is the sign still supposed to be there? I don't know. I don't know. It was never a sign. There. It was never a sign posted there. I, I, went with the, I went with the staff member when it was posted. I saw it being we posted. We actually saw, I'm sorry, Mr. Tavares today. Mm -hmm. Because he looked into the property and there was no sign. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll we'll, we'll inspect the uh, yeah. We'll we'll investigate that. Right. Sometimes it might have fallen off. It might have. It was kind of windy <clears throat> a couple of days. Well, it like might have. We live literally. Right there. But it sounds to me like the major concern, and I'd like the applicant to have the opportunity to come back and address it because it's a concern of mine, is your concern, which is the seismology or whatever the term would be of removal of ledge and how that may. Uh, negatively impact your structures and even your quality of life while it's being done. So if we'll give the applicant an opportunity, I'd like to hear from him uh, well, addressing well, that. The lady after me on the end of Hickey, they, they put the water main because I guess my house used to feed that house as, as a water main. Mm -hmm. So Butterworth and Check went over there to put the water main and it took them over nine days of, of the, the hammer. Mm -hmm. Nine days just, just to break that, that ledge. Okay. So basically. Well, why don't, if you'll be so kind to allow the applicant to, I don't want to cut you off, but let's hear what the, I want to hear what he has to say re relative to the blasting or ledge removal. Uh, yeah, with regard, well, let me address a couple of think things that were probably just misspoke but so we're not proposing two single families we're proposing one two family house the the units are connected um, so uh, just to clarify that for for the record the there is some ledge to be removed uh, I'm not a geologist uh, I'm the director of construction so we'd hire the qualified contractors to do that um, in it, uh, assessing the <coughs> viability of this and the cost effectiveness cost effectiveness of this. So we, we removed, we stripped some material from the lot um, and we exposed the ledge, which um, as the tenant uh, properly pointed out, that is between our two properties in essence. Um, so this is the ledge in question to be removed. Um, I had a contractor look at that, um, uh, Scott Walker. He felt that it was about a day of hammering. We've used them pretty reliably in the past uh, so that, that would be the approach, is hammering is a lot less invasive than, than blasting, but we, we would be relying on the, you know, the experts in that field to make sure they were doing it without impacting any neighbor's properties. Obviously, we'd be, 
we'd be liable for any any um, adverse effect to any neighboring property. So we we'd ensure that that um, didn't happen. Okay, thank you, uh, Miss Young. I don't know if this is for Mr. Herbansky or for the applicant, but I need some education as it relates to at what <coughs> stage in the approval process does our town engineering department or fire department look at plans for blasting, regrading, what impacts there will be not only to adjacent properties but to drainage patterns, things of that nature. If someone could educate me on can I ask for that now or is that a cross your fingers and hope for the best it'll happen later or does it not happen at all? It would happen during the building permit process. When the applicant comes in, they file for their permits. It goes through uh, zoning, fire marshal, if it would need this project, I don't think would require fire marshal sign off because it's not three family or commercial. Uh, uh, and then at that point, it goes to the engineering department for review and then the building department. So it's during that phase where they would be assessing <coughs> the engineering of this project where, you know, similar to um, the, the resident who spoke, you know, at that point, I'm sure that they determined that they were probably gonna put some footings in. And then after, once they got through the process, they probably found out, well, the footings aren't gonna work. You're gonna need to pin into the ledge and use the ledge as your footings. So it's during the internal, the review of the building permit is when um, that would be caught. Thank you. Okay, is there anyone else in chambers that would like to speak in opposition to this application? Uh, there being none, I will take a motion to close the public hearing on 16 Goodwin Place by Mr. Hoydick, seconded by Mr. Tavares. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We're, we close the hearing on this. Yeah, but I stood up. What insurance do we still get, though? If you'll, why don't you stay at the hearing and maybe when this is deliberated, you may hear something you like. Okay, um, back to Ms. Young. Would you be so kind to read item number five on our agenda? <clears throat> item number five, 434, Housatonic Avenue, petition of John B. Hughes, seeking a waiver of section 3.11 to allow for the construction <coughs> of an attached garage incidental to a single family dwelling in an RS-4 hardship parcel pre-existing prior to current zoning standards for RS-4 zone. Hi, uh, good evening. I'm John Hughes, I'm the homeowner. Um, Ted Dombrowski is my architect and I'm gonna stand up here in case I can help with any questions, but I'm gonna ask Ted to um, address the, uh, the board. And, and before you do that, do you have your certificates of mailing that you can yes. hand in? Should I pass them over? Pass them, yes, now, okay. thank you. Good evening, Chairman, board members. My name is Ted Dombrowski, Dombrowski Architects, 71 Whitfield Street, Guilford, Connecticut. I'm here with uh, Britt Hughes this evening regarding uh, a waiver of section 311 uh, for accessory buildings. Um, what we're proposing is in addition to this to existing uh, house, uh, a one and a half, uh, story Cape. The proposed garage we're locating along the along the west side of the property, and we're we're seeking a waiver in order to uh, allow a reduction in the required side yard setback. The proposed addition for the garage meets the requirement of the allowable height being less than 12 feet. Um, it, it scales out at, at 11 foot 10 inches. The, the setback at the 50% allowable into the side yard, we're at 5.1 feet. So we meet that side yard requirement. Um, in Jay's comments about the requirements for the waiver, where we are deficient in the, in the regulation is the opposite side or the east side of the property 
that is existing at 5.6, where the regulation requires uh, that you meet the RS4 standard at 10 feet. That 5.6 on the east side is existing um, and is not involved in, in any of the construction. So that 5.6 is existing and we're not proposing to change that at all. Um, the house was built in 1946 and that east side of the property has not been added on to or renovated uh, <laughs> since that time. So that's always been an existing side yard that did not meet the requirement. The property itself doesn't, does not meet the current RS4 regulation for a 64 foot, uh, excuse me, a 60 foot frontage were at approximately 55 feet for overall widths. Um, so our hardship is that the, the property does not meet the standard and the house as uh, initially constructed is off center on the property so we don't have 10 feet on each of the side yards. Um, as I'm sure you're aware, this property is on Housatonic Avenue. The, the rear yard fronts or faces out to the river and across the, across the river to Milford, uh, the Milford Shore. For that reason, we're locating the attached one car garage at the side of the house rather than the rear yard. Um, we didn't want to block views by either attaching a garage adjacent to the house or a detached uh, one or two car garage in the block in, in the back and uh, and then block the the owner's views so for that reason we kept the the proposed uh, garage right up tight to the house in order to preserve views and uh, make the most of the yard for uh, for the owners In, in Jay's comments regarding his review of the application, um, I just wanted to clarify that Jay had commented that the garage must meet the 10 foot minimum. The garage is constructed, is allowed to go 50% in, into the side yard. So the garage does meet the standard. It's the existing opposite side that we're not changing that is short from the 10 feet. Yeah. We also have updated copies of the survey that we, we gave J one copy, but he asked for additional copies for uh, commission members. <coughs> so we'd like to hand those in. Are there, are there any questions? Okay, any questions from the board? Mr. Hoydick. Yeah, I do. Um, facing the house from the street, there's a row of trees or bushes along that side. Right. Are those yours or the, the neighbors? Um, my father is the neighbor and um, I'm purchasing five feet plus, <clears throat> plus uh, of that property right now. And I didn't take a tape measure out, but the new property line will be more or less directly in line with that set of trees. Are you going to keep any kind of a buffer, like, um, like if, trees or shrubs, after the garage is built? The plan is to keep as many of the trees that are there now, keep them there, and if we have to take some down, to replace them after the project's done. Okay, thank yeah. you. Any other questions from our board? Ms. Young? Uh, I don't have the revised plan yet, but it sounded like Mr. Hrabanski was given a preview of it. So since I don't have it and he saw it, and I'm still waiting for my folded copy, can I ask if he is satisfied with it? Yes. Um, basically what I, I wanted to make sure of was, what, was that uh, we weren't creating any new non-conforming lots Therefore, I wanted a zone development table for each of the properties. Um, and uh, let's see, what was my other concern? 
And the other concern was that um, in terms of the lot coverage, they were counting all the property to the south of this zone X uh, AE zone with the base flood elevation 11 towards the lot coverage. That area, because it's wetlands, wetlands area does not count towards lot area. So uh, they revised that as well, and they are still under the 25% uh, maximum lot area. So I am satisfied with both my concerns. Thank you. Any other questions from our board? Seeing none, is there anyone here to speak in favor of this application? Is there anyone here to speak against this application? Being none, I'll entertain a motion to close the public hearing for 434 Housatonic Avenue. Can we still take these plans post-closing? Yeah, he's, you're taking them right now. Thank They're you. being submitted, yes. Uh, motion to close. Motion to close by Ms. Young, seconded by Mr. Tavares. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Carried unanimously. Okay, at this time, there's one more item on the agenda. I am going to recuse myself as chairman and ask Mr. Tavares to sit in my place and also to have our alternate, Mr. Petroselli, uh, sit on the board for this application. Uh, good evening, I'm Paul Tavares and I'm filling in for uh, being chair and uh, what we're going to do is because uh, Mr. DeSulio has recused himself uh, right after we uh, listened to the Margarita Lawn uh, application, we're going to go into the public, we're going to close it off, go into a public session and then uh, we're going to take Margarita Lawn, make a vote and after the vote we're going to switch back. Or, uh, and I Thank will excuse uh, Mr. Petroselli. So, Mr. Petroselli, would you please read item six into the record? Number six. Thank you. Good evening, sir. State your name, your address, and your affiliation with this application, please. Yes. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Mr. Urbanski, Madam Clerk. My name is uh, Robert Rosati. I'm an attorney here in Stratford with my father, Thomas Rosati. Our office is at 3241 Main Street. I'm also a resident of Stratford. Before I go any further, I'd like to submit the mailings. Thank you. Uh, we're going to pick, pick up where we left off on this matter. Uh, <clears throat> I am here tonight representing Mr. Alvarez regarding Lot 700 Mar Margarita Lawn. Uh, as I, I think you all uh, recall, um, the history behind this application is uh, we filed an application February 7th, 2017 to this board for approval of a lot width variance to build a single family home on a 50 by 100 foot lot in an RS4 zone, uh, the, uh, 
uh, on Margarita Lawn. We presented that application before you on April 4th and May 2nd, 2017. We gave an extensive history and presentation that there was no merger uh, with lot 699 Margarita Lawn because uh, as you know, we don't have a merger doctrine and there was no intent to merge uh, this property. Uh, we also gave uh, an extensive presentation that you had uh, the ability to hear this application, even though there was a prior application for uh, this property in lot 699 uh, that was denied in 2007. <clears throat> uh, we also created an extensive record uh, showing that a hardship uh, existed for this property, uh, that the lot uh, pre-existed since 1913 uh, and then was hardship by the uh, enactment of the zoning regulations. Uh, that is all in the record, uh, uh, and it's still in the record before you ton tonight. This is a remand, it's a continuation uh, of those hearings. So that, that all is part of the record. Um, but even though we did prove there was no merger, even though we did show that we had a right to uh, be heard even though we're, there was that prior 2007 denial uh, because there were uh, substantial changes. Even though we did prove that uh, we had a hardship, uh, our ap application was denied by this board on May 2nd, uh, 2017 by a three to two vote. <clears throat> we then appealed that denial to the Bridgeport Superior Court and on March 29th, of this year, 2018, Judge Radcliffe remanded this application back to you to make very specific findings. And uh, that brings us up to date. That's why we're here tonight. I believe you all have a copy of Judge Radcliffe's decision. I'd like to just enter another stamped uh, copy of it into the record. And I'd like to paraphrase what uh, Judge Radcliffe's uh, remand back to this uh, board uh, says uh, and the specific purposes of that remand. Uh, the, the, the first thing, uh, he remanded this back to this board for a determination of procedural issues of similarity of applications and merger by a vote uh, of the majority of members, and then to determine hardship by a vote of the supermajority of members. <clears throat> so number one, uh, w tonight you have to vote uh, the procedural issues of similarity of applications and merger by a majority count, and then you can move uh, to the underlying issue of hardship and act on that uh, by a supermajority vote. <clears throat> now, it's important uh, to look at Judge Ratcliffe's uh, uh, decision. Uh, on those um, preliminary issues of similarity of applications and merger, Judge Ratcliffe stated on page seven of, of his decision that the record would support the conclusion that, that the majority of the board found both the, the procedural issues uh, of merger and similarity of uh, applications. Um, he found those issues in favor of the plaintiff, Mr. Alvarez. Uh, but because no collective findings concerning those procedural issues were made, the judge remanded the case back to the board to make those findings again by a majority vote. As Judge Radcliffe states on page 12 of his decision, because the record compiled before the board is sufficient to make findings regarding both issues, this matter is remanded to Stratford Board of Zoning Appeals for the purpose of making specific findings. <clears throat> now again, regarding these procedural issues, the similarity of applications, Judge Ratcliffe pointed out on page nine of his decision that the prior 2007 application involved two separate applications concerning both 700 Margarita Lawn and 699 Margarita, Margarita Lawn. The application submitted 10 years later, this application 
applies only to lot 700 Margarita Lawn. The 2007 application sought three variances to 699 Margarita Lawn, along with a frontage variance for 700 Margarita Lawn. The later application, this application, contains only a single request for a frontage variance applicable to lot 700 Margarita Lawn. The 2017 application, again, the one before you tonight, showed changes in the site plan <clears throat> from the plan submitted in 2007. Judge Ratcliffe then stated on page 10 of the, his decision that the court is in full agreement with the implicit findings of three members of the board and the advice given by the planning administrator, Mr. Abansky, following a staff review of the plaintiff's application. Namely, uh, what he's referring to is that the pending application was properly before the board and could be heard. Now regarding the procedural issue of merger, Judge Ratcliffe on page, uh, pages 10 through 11 of his decision points out that the mere fact contigu contiguous land is owned by the same person does not create any presumption that it constitutes a single lot or parcel. Stratford does not have a merger provision in its zoning regulations. Therefore, any claim of merger must establish that the owner of the contiguous parcels or his predecessor in title intended to form a single tract or parcel. Here, the two parcels are separately identified in each of the conveyances and were the subject of separate requests for variances in 2007. No portion of the dwellings at 699 Margarita Lawn encroaches upon 700 Margarita Lawn. He then states on page 11 of his decision that the record would support a finding that no merger has occurred due to the acts of the plaintiff, Mr. Alvarez, or his predecessors in titles. So, Judge Ratcliffe thinks there's no similarity of this uh, application to a prior application and that this application can properly be heard and he thinks there is no merger. Uh, but he sent it back to, to this board tonight to make those findings by a majority vote. <clears throat> now, on the issue of hardship, Judge Ratcliffe states on page 13 of his decision that compliance with the comprehensive plan is usually met when the use to be allowed is consistent with, with other uses in the area. If a hardship is created by the enactment or by an amendment to a zoning regulation and a predecessor in title could have sought a variance, a subsequent owner may also request a variance. He also pointed out on page seven that a majority of the board supported the granting of the variance and made a finding of hardship. So uh, again, Judge Ratcliffe thought there was a hardship, but he didn't have the ability to, to make that finding, so he sent it back to you to make that finding of a hardship by a four to one supermajority vote. So those are Judge Radcliffe's specific instructions uh, of how you uh, are to vote today, uh, tonight. Um, Mr. Bansky in his uh, additional review dated September 14th, 2018, also lays it out for you. Uh, I, I know you all have a copy of it. Um, Mr. Bansky states, as Judge Radcliffe has determined in his memorandum of decision, um, the ZBA is tasked with the following. Is the current application the same as 2007 application which was denied? The planning and zoning staff has already taken the position that the current application is indeed different from the 2007 application. Judge Ratcliffe appears to agree with this position on page nine of his memorandum of decision. Therefore, the ZBA must take, make this determination part of the record. As 98 Margarita Lawn merged with the abutting lot 700, planning and zoning staff does not feel merger has occurred as the town of Stratford does not have a merger regulation. Judge Ratcliffe has opined that although the record would support a finding that merger has not occurred, no explicit finding to the effect was made by the board. Therefore, the ZBA must make that determination part of the record. <clears throat> First, the ZBA must make the two above determinations based upon a majority vote. <clears throat> the, uh, 
then the board uh, is to consider whether Mr. Alvarez in, is entitled to his requested variance. Essentially, the ZBA must determine if a legitimate hardship is present. That requires four votes to be approved. The planning and zoning staff remains of the opinion that the subject application fulfills the hardship requirements per 8-6 of our Connecticut statutes. So I've said it, uh, Mr. Bansky has said it, uh, Attorney Florek, he's not gonna admit it, but I, I, I think he believes it. And the most important thing is Judge Ratcliffe says so, that number one, you have the ability to hear this application even though there was a 2007 denial. Number two, there is no merger. And number three, uh, there is a hardship. The first two, you have to make a, a majority vote. The last one, you have to make a super uh, majority vote. Now, there's one other thing. Um, last time there was opposition. This time there is uh, no opposition uh, from the neighbor at 150 Margarita Lawn. Um, that that um, uh, is not on the table tonight. Uh, for their benefit, uh, the owners of 150 Margarita Lawn, uh, as part of a, an approval, the applicant would agree to two conditions, that the home will be constructed with a front yard setback of 22 feet instead of 20 feet. Um, the result of that is, uh, if you know Margarita Lawn and the, um, the gap between the street line and, and the homeowner line, that's gonna result in the home being 40 feet from uh, the Margarita Lawn paved street line on that side of the, uh, of the street. It's gonna make it consistent with um, the, uh, the other setbacks of the home. So that, uh, that's a 22, set, 22 foot setback that we would agree to. The other condition that uh, we will agree to to benefit 150 Margarita Lawn is construction of the home will not commence until 150 Margarita Lawn is sold to a third party or one year from the date uh, of the appeal period uh, for, for the uh, decision here tonight, whichever first occurs. Uh, <clears throat> so the applicant uh, urges you to, to make, um, uh, to grant this application, to make those findings, uh, to, to take those uh, majority and super majority votes. Uh, I don't want to uh, belabor this any longer. Uh, the applicant's been uh, persistent. It's taken a lot of time and energy on, on his part. It's taken a lot of time and energy on uh, uh, this board's part, the staff's part, uh, the town attorney's part, and um, we urge you to do your part now and, and grant this application. Finally, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rosati. Uh, does the board have any questions for Attorney Rosati? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I'd just be curious. I see Mr. Um, Prado in attendance. Before we start asking questions of Mr. Rosati, um, if he's still in opposition, um, even though the, the person that opposed it is withdrawn, if he still has the same stance as he did when we um, voted on the application last time, could we hear from him? When we get to the part of folks that want to speak in opposition, they'll have a chance to speak. Okay, thank you. Sure. Any other questions? Ms. Streets? Uh, yes, uh, we do have a letter from uh, Mr. Tom O'Connor, who is in opposition. Are you aware of this? Yes, that, that's the same letter that was submitted the, the, the last time, um, and we are aware of it. Uh, he didn't speak the last time. I don't believe he's here tonight speaking. He said something in writing. Yep. Okay. I am aware of it. Thank you. Ms. Young? I heard you describe two conditions you're willing to accept to benefit 150 Margarita Lawn. Yes. Do you have those conditions in writing that you were reciting from? Uh, I, I could sum, submit them to Mr. Bansky in writing. Uh, I just we, want to make sure I heard them correctly. Could you more slowly repeat them? Absolutely, absolutely. The two conditions for the benefit of 150 Margarita, Margarita Lawn as, as conditions of an approval would be the home will be constructed 
with a front yard setback of 22 feet uh, so that it would be 40 feet from the Margarita Lawn paved street line on that side. And construction of the home will not commence until 150 Margarita Lawn is sold to a third party or one year from the date the appeal period for the approval expires, whichever first occurs. Thank you. You're welcome. No other questions? Does the board have any other questions? With that, is there anyone here to speak in favor of this application? Seeing none, is there anyone here that would like to speak in opposition of this application? State your name and address, sir. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman. Attorney Benjamin Proto, uh, Commissioner Hoytick had asked about our position. Uh, we take no position this evening. Um, as you heard, there are certain conditions that the applicant has agreed to uh, to, uh, to benefit my client's property. So at this point, uh, the arguments that we made some time ago, um, we won't be making this evening. Is there anyone else in attendance that would like to speak in opposition of this application? Seeing none, uh, do we have a motion to close this application? Motion to close. Motion to close by Ms. Young. Second? Second by Mr. Petroselli. Um, do we have a motion to close the public hearing? Second uh, by Mr. Petroselli, second by Ms. Young. Um, would anyone like to have a five minute break? Or would you like to go right into administration? No? Seeing none? The public hearing is now closed and uh, we will open the administrative hearing. And we're going to go through the reverse. We're going to see uh, the Margarita Lawn application first. So is there a motion to take Margarita Lawn off the table? So moved. So moved by Ms. Young, second. Second by Mr. Petroselli. All in favor? Aye. Discussion? Uh, will the chair be guiding the board members as instructed by Mr. Hibanski as to what questions to ask first, second, third, et cetera? Uh, however you feel, however you are see fit. I think at this hour we could all appreciate some guidance from the chair as to what steps to take first, second, et cetera as uh, described by Mr. Hibanski in his memorandum of September 14th. Attorney well, Florek. Sure, so um, as Attorney Rosati stated, um, the board, uh, Judge Radcliffe sent this back down here from the Superior Court. Uh, so and before you consider whether or not the applicant is entitled to a hardship, you have to consider two procedural questions. Um, whether the two lots that are owned both by Mr. Alvarez have merged, uh, and whether that, and the second question is whether the board can consider this in light of the fact that the applicant uh, made an application for an application uh, for a variance in 2007. You are to determine those two questions by a majority vote. So three out of five of you. Uh, if you find that you can consider this application in light of the 2007 application and that the lots have not merged, you then move on to determine whether or not uh, the, application, the applicant is entitled to a variance and that is done by a, a super majority vote or four of you, four out of five of you. Um, so I would take those procedural questions first. First, whether this board can consider the application in light of the 2007 application and second, whether or not the two lots have merged. And then move on to the variance question. Thank you. Any, anything? I'll be right here in case you guys have any questions. Ms. Young? I'd like to make a motion that I believe the pending application is not the same as the 2007 application. We received a lot of new information between then and now. Uh, and therefore, I believe to the first part of the question, yes, we can be reviewing this application. And secondly, I do not believe merger has occurred. But I don't know if you want to take them one at a time and get feedback from others. Mr. 
Mr. Vansky. Roll call vote. Mr. Vansky, were you about to say something? I think we should handle each, each one independently. So uh, back to where I began. Uh, I do not believe this is the same application as 2007 and therefore we may review it now. That is my opinion and my motion. Moved by Ms. Young, second by Mr. Petroselli. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Pass it unanimously. Okay, so for our second. I do not believe merger has occurred and therefore again we can continue to down this path of looking at the third question. That's All in favor? Outside. Second by Mr. Petroselli. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Pass unanimously. Mr. Urbanski, if we miss a step, you'll let us know. Thank you. I think that then allows us to get to the nature of the question of whether or not hardship is proven to uh, authorize the variance. Any discussion? Are we taking this to a vote? I think someone has to make a motion to whether or not to grant. Are we going to make a motion to vote to grant the variance? The motion grant, uh, made by Mr. Petroselli, second by. I'll second the motion if he identifies the hardship for why he's going to grant the variance or make the motion for granting the variance. Maybe off the agenda where it's listed. <laughs> Sergeant being the pre-existing non-conforming lot that predates zoning. Is that his motion? Yes. I second his motion. Second by Ms. Young. Motion started by Mr. Petroselli. Are we has her hand up. Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Treats. May I make an amendment to that motion to include um, that the conditions that are um, agreed upon that were presented by the owner of 150 Margarita Lawn also be satisfied. Mm -hmm. and to that end, Ms. Streets, you're referring to a front yard setback at 22 feet and uh, there shall be no construction of this home until uh, this home at 150 Margarita Lawn has been sold or one year from the date of the appeal, whichever happens first. Yes, I am. I second her amendment to the motion made. All in favor? Aye. 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 Pass unanimously. Is there a motion to vote? M Mr. Chairman? Oh, that was a vote on the uh, amendment to the motion, just to be clear. Oh. Yes. To accept the amendment? Okay. Yeah. Now you vote on the, the main motion, which was to grant the variance. No, 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 absolutely. absolutely. Make a motion to approve the amended motion. <laughs> That's accurate? <laughs> yes. Ms. Streets, do you want to yes. second my motion to yes. approve your amended okay. motion? <laughs> motion uh, approved by Ms. Young, second by Ms. Streets. All in favor? Aye. 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 Pass unanimously. Oh. We'll see if we got it right enough. Let's <laughs> so make sure we have all this. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I wanted to say something. There's that gentleman in the back. Do you know who he is? Okay.
schedule? Okay, um, Okay. can I get a motion to take item uh, 350 Whippoorwill Lane off the table? Mr. DeVar, seconded by Mr. Hoydick, now open for discussion. I guess I'll go first. Um, the applicant argued no less than 50 times that it's a one acre lot in a one acre zone. Uh, one of my concerns with this application is there are provisions for a flag lot or a rear lot. It simply requires one and a half acres. Um, that is one of the plethora of uh, requests for variances and that is of concern to me personally. Um, and also, uh, Ms. Young, you brought up that, which I didn't know, thank you for asking the question, but that this is really not a building lot. It's a assemblage of some sort that is going for a resubdivision should they get the waivers. Um, so that we're creating a lot is what we're doing. Yeah. Pardon me? I think we're enabling their opportunity to seek approval for a building lot. Right, right, right. Um, my two cents. That almost sounded like a motion. Were you making a motion? No, chair does not make motions. I was just giving input. We should talk about those bylaws sometime. I'm sorry? We should talk about our bylaws sometime. <coughs> uh, I will make a motion, unless there's one, wants to be other discussion. I found this to be a self-created hardship, and for that reason, I would make a motion to deny, to, to deny the application. Okay, so we have a motion to deny by Ms. Young. Do I have a second on that motion? I will second. I remain unconvinced that this is a true hardship. Uh, seconded by Ms. Streis. Any additional discussion on this motion? I'd like to take a roll call vote on a motion to deny. Ms. Young? Aye. Mr. Tavares? Aye. Ms. Streets? Aye. Mr. Hoydick? Aye. And Mr. DeCilio votes yes. A motion to deny passes 5 0. Next item on the agenda uh, would the board member like to take 7476 Warwick Avenue off the table? I'll make the motion. Motion by Mr. Hoydick. Second. Seconded by Ms. Young. Open for discussion, deliberation. I'll make a motion to deny. I, I believe there were other alternatives that could have been explored that did not necessitate the granting of a variance uh, for height. <coughs> so <coughs> I don't believe adequate hardship was proven uh, related to the land and for that reason, failure to provide 
hardship would be my rationale for a motion to deny. Any second? Second. Second by Mr. DeVars. <coughs> Any discussion? We'll take a roll call vote on a motion to deny 7476 Warwick Avenue. Ms. Young? Aye. Mr. Tavares? Aye. Ms. Streets? Aye. Mr. Hoydick? Aye. And Mr. DeCilio? Yes. Motion to deny passes 5 0. Uh, motion to take 361 Canaan Road off the table. Okay. Um, do we have a second? Second. Oh. Mr. Hoydick, your hand was a little slow there. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Tavares got the second in. I'd like to make a motion to approve the application with the hardship of pre-existing non-conforming location as well as public safety. We have a motion to approve by Mary Young. We have a seconded by Mr. Hoydick. Second. Any discussion? There being none, we'll take a roll call vote on the motion to approve 361 Canaan Road. Ms. Young? Aye. Mr. Tavares? Aye. Ms. Streets? Aye. Mr. Hoydick? Aye. And Mr. DeCilio votes yes. Motion to approve passes unanimously 5 0. <coughs> Motion Excuse to me. take off the table 16 Goodwin Place. Busy with coughing my sinuses out here. I apologize. And what, what did you say, Mary? Motion to take off the table 16 Goodwin Place. 15 Goodwin Place. Motion to take off the table by Ms. Young. Second. Seconded by Mr. Tavares. <clears throat> so this is interesting. The, um, uh, the folks that opposed this didn't necessarily oppose the application. Right. They had construction concerns. Yeah. And I think uh, should anyone here at the board make a motion to approve, <clears throat> my input would be that, um, that the uh, have a condition that a pre-demolition survey is done uh, for visible inspection of adjoining property, adjacent properties uh, of some distance, whatever, and then um, a post demolition survey to basically prove to the neighbor, to be responsible, force the applicant to be responsible. That's all. Uh, I don't want to waste money. I know it's a nonprofit, but I think it's, it, it in this case, bears. I have a question. Sure. Uh, maybe Jay can answer it. Um, do we have the right to um, request? some type of bond or some type of insurance that has to be um, posted prior to the, um, the demolition or the, um, the removal of the, the ledge. Is there something that we could put in there? I don't think we can require a bond for private improvements. Um, usually bonds are required for, let's say when there's a subdivision for the running of utilities, sidewalks, continuation of the street, those different forms of public utility um, or public improvements. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know, and this is kind of dovetailing on what Chairman DeCilio had to say, I think a little bit earlier, is that whenever there's gonna be any blasting that's done, usually there is an insurance <coughs> clause that must be taken out by the applicant and, in the amount of whatever the value of, I think, the surrounding properties that could potentially be affected are. I'm not in the blasting industry, no, I, I don't you know, know myself, yeah. so I don't know for, for certain that that's exactly what happens. I know I've heard that in testimony and other applications here in Stratford that that is required, uh, but then again, I, so to answer your question, I don't think it's appropriate for this board to require a bond, okay. um, because how would we value no, I know. It would be speculative on the damages. Yeah. So I would have a hard time even coming up with a, with a number. So I would be hesitant to, to tie a bond to a, a condition of approval. All right, thank you. Yes, Ms. Young? Uh, I'd like to make a motion to approve the hardship uh, being the unusual shape with the conditions that a pre-blast and post-blast survey be submitted by the applicant and the four items that were listed on the October 19th memorandum from Jay Habansky. Uh, the responses provided to be made conditions. Uh, yes, each owner will uh, be independent of one another. 
Uh, yes, they will all be required to live on site. Yes, uh, the area will be uh, loaned and seeded. Yes, there will be a shed as agreed to by the applicant to uh, allow for any lawnmowers or other home maintenance equipment. And yes, there will be a decorative window or architectural feature uh, added to the street facing gable end of unit one and to the east facing gable at end of unit two to improve the overall design aesthetic again as agreed to by the applicant. And, and before that is seconded, um, may I make a friendly amendment suggestion? Please. Instead of using the term blasting because one of the um, Neighbor, neighbors said they use sometimes hydraulic hammers, so that wouldn't be considered blasting. That ledge removal be replaced, uh, the word blasting. Uh, I, I, yes, thank you for that amendment. <laughs> You're welcome. Do we have a second to that motion? Oh, I'm sorry, possibly another. Before that, I have a question. <clears throat> Will the affected neighbors be notified of said procedures for removing the rock? I, I think they would need to be, because they to do the survey, they have to actually photograph their foundations and things like that. So Perhaps I would guess. Mr. Tavares is suggesting we uh, add, add that, that too. Yeah. Oh, sure. We can okay. add that too. Mr. Bansky. I just want to clarify just uh, something. Uh, so the pre and post <coughs> uh, ledge removal surveys are done to abutting property owners? Yes, abutters. Okay. Abutting. And then uh, the um, four recommendations or comments that I made, those are conditions of approval as well, the responses. Correct. Okay, just checking. <coughs> okay, so we have and a couple. And we added the hardship, not what they offered, but what we heard during the testimony, the unusual shape. Okay, so do we have our motion? Do we have a second on that motion? Seconded second by Mr. Tavares, thank you. <clears throat> Any additional discussion? Uh, Ms. Street, so yes, I just discussion. playing devil's advocate. I, I, I just want some. I just want to be assured that the ledge removal is going to be done in a manner that will um, nat natively affect the adjacent properties. And so, my question is: What if the pre and post survey uh, would indicate that it would damage the properties? Then what? Mm -hmm. would we do? Yeah, but my question is, if say um, we approve this and then the survey, yeah. Mean, you know, the, I am sure that the demolition contractor and Habitat for Humanity will be responsible by not only their choice, but by an attorney knocking on their door, <laughs> should their <laughs> neighbor's you know, garage fall down sure or crack or whatever. Mr. Hubansky has yeah. a hand. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm, my notes you're talking about. So <coughs> a pre, the pre-demolition sur survey, as the chairman uh, Yeah, I meant to be a pre-blast, but yeah, same. Is, yeah. is uh, that's just, it's so that it sets a baseline so that when they come back to measure, <coughs> they can determine, okay, after the ledge work was done, we know that this person's, it, the, the pre-survey wouldn't say, no, you can't go forward, you can't do it. It just sets the baseline so when they come right. back to check. It, it's an insurance so that the, um, neighbor who already has a crack in the wall doesn't say, oh, the blasting caused it because the pre-survey shows the condition mm -hmm. and the post-survey shows the condition and then you can logically extrapolate that the, the ledge removal caused it and that's the reason for the bookends um, survey okay, and there's an expense to it and I know it's affordable housing but I think it's a necessary. I also think if I made the question I asked Mr. Bansky during the hearing about what assurances do any of us have, including the neighbors, about the checks and balances prior to permits being issued? And Mr. Hibansky offered that there's a host of town departments who will have that check and balance and that won't get a permit if, the, if it fails to comply with the minimum standards. Nine feet or five feet, I'm sure the building department is going to, or somebody's going to say, you got to put a fence up there. Um, I don't think we need to condition that. Um, I think that will be handled in the, those, those departments. 
So the chairman has lost control. We have a motion, we have a second, and we have some additional discussion. Are there, is there any other concerns or discussion? Okay, let's take a roll call vote on um, 16 Goodwin Place. <clears throat> motion to approve, Mary Young. Aye. Mr. Tavares. Aye. Ms. Streets. Aye. Mr. Hoydick. Aye. And Mr. DeCilio votes yes. Passes unanimously, subject to conditions. Okay, we have one remaining item. If someone would like to take 434 Hustanic Avenue off the table. Uh, so move. Okay, by Mr. Tavares. Second. Seconded by Ms. Young. Any discussion? I'll just comment that this is a very interesting application because what he's doing is not creating the hardship. The hardship already exists on the other side of the house, which is too close to the property line, and it's triggering his requirement of bringing it legally, I guess, conforming by our ZBA waiver, correct? Correct. However, if no detached garage was being proposed, <coughs> there wouldn't be any variance needed, but but it, but it would still be, yeah, it would still be four point something feet from right. the property line. Yeah, interesting. As a point of discussion, um, Mr. Hibanski suggested in his October 22nd memorandum a condition if we were so inclined to approve this for anyone making a motion. That condition being uh, the applicant to file a mylar in the town clerk's office prior to <coughs> hearing any permits reflecting the lot line revision. Oh, of course, yeah. Makes sense. Okay, would anyone like to make a motion? Would anyone like to make a motion? I feel like I hogged the microphone. But no, I'll you're doing great. You're, you're our leader. You're great. <laughs> I'll make a motion to approve uh, based upon the pre existing conditions. Uh, prior to current zoning standards for the RS-4 zone as listed on the <coughs> agenda. Uh, with the condition, as I just described, that uh, the applicant should be required to file a mylar in the town clerk's office prior to securing any permits reflecting the proposed lot line revision. So the motion is conditioned by Mary Young. Second. second. Mary Young? Aye. Mr. Tavares? Aye. Ms. Streets? Aye. Mr. Hoydick? Aye. And Mr. DeCilio votes yes, passes 5-0. Okay, so that closes <clears throat> our administrative session. Um, would anyone like to make a motion to approve the minutes of the October 10th if anybody can remember that meeting, the 2018 regular <laughs> yeah. meeting. A motion, to approve. motion by Ms. Young. Second. Seconded by who was that? Mr. Tavares. Paul. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Carried unanimously. We have nothing for CAM site review. Members' concerns, comments. Uh, item number one changes the ZBA application. So these were some changes that uh, the chairman had brought up, um, seems like six months ago, but maybe yeah. four or five months <laughs> ago. Um, while the chairman was traveling, uh, we, there was some discussion uh, regarding, um, uh, you know, regarding the, the changes that were discussed and um, no one wanted to make any votes or any determinations until you were back. Um, the changes, and I'll just quickly go over them. Um, the certificates of mailing are to be delivered to the Office of Planning and Zoning. And uh, Mr. Chairman, while you're away, uh, one of the, su the suggestions was that we change that they be delivered seven days prior as opposed to three days prior. And uh, I'm all in favor of that. I have no concern with that. Um, Uh, for when an A2 survey is required, we basically changed some of the language on 
what type of plans are required. Uh, we went from a plot <coughs> plan to an A2 survey, um, and we added uh, above ground swimming pool, pools that need a variance. They are going to require an A2 survey, and the same thing with a fence. Uh, everyone seemed to be in agreement with those suggestions as well. Um, we had item number three on page four. Uh, we wanted to indicate which zone development standard was being sought for a variance by either adding an asterisk or bold or whatever it is. They just have to identify that. Um, the, again, on page six, we talked about uh, the certificates of mailing being uh, delivered seven days prior to the public hearing to the Office of Planning and Zoning. And those were the changes that were discussed. And the one amendment, I believe, was just that we changed from three days to seven days for the certificates of mailing. Ms. Streets? I think I also added it should be seven business days. I know. Oh, that's right. Seven. W what is the statutory requirement for mailing business days 10? There is no statutory requirement. Oh, OK. That's a local requirement that we're doing. Okay, so, but they always have to have, to get on the public hearing agenda, they generally have to be in the previous month around the 1st. No, it's just only about a 30-day window. It's 35 days are the, are the previously scheduled <coughs> public hearing is the date of receipt. It has to be advertised uh, no more than 15 days and no less than uh, set, I don't remember. The okay, so the application comes in, got it, got it. So you have plenty of time. That's a good recommendation. Can I add something for consideration to what you've already put together? It came up, I don't know, three or four times this evening. I'm not a big fan of the, I'll submit to you at the hearing new information that no one has seen, including potentially opposing parties, not to mention the staff. I particularly was offended by one of our attorneys who we've seen so often <coughs> who had comments from Jay Habansky weeks in advance, perhaps held on to this information until it was delivered to us at the hearing. I would like the recommendation or the consideration by the board to seek as a form of recommendation, we can't mandate everything come a week ahead of time, but a recommendation that any supplemental materials for consideration by the board be provided no later than seven days prior to the hearing. I can't mandate it because everyone has the right to throw everything in the kitchen sink at us right until the close of the public hearing, but if we can send a message, this is our preference, so it's clear that the surprise attack or whatever you want to call it is not desirable, that would be my recommendation. We do that uh, where I work. <coughs> so do you think that would be a recommendation under that you're required to give this, 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 by the way, in parentheses, you know, the commission respectfully requests that any um, maps documents uh, to be submitted ahead of time so they can, you know, do their, take the time to digest it versus a cursory view at the public hearing or something? I don't know, yeah. I can write it. I think Jay, uh, again, has done well by us, and I would yield to him to construct the language. I think if you are clear on my intent, I will take faith that you will, can construct it. And the timing is to allow your office to receive it and deliver it to us in the form of the packet, which I'm guessing is seven days, but you can tell me if there's another number that's better. It's approximately they go out. We usually try to get them out seven days the Tuesday before our meeting. and. So maybe if you had it 10 days, that would allow you time to figure out what do you have and then stick it in a packet seven days prior. And that's the deadline that we give everybody. I mean, what you want is exactly what I want as well. We would prefer to have all the plans, any modifications, any revised plans in, in your hands as well. Um, so maybe <coughs> let me... If we, they start submitting stuff, we say, okay, great. Well, we're going to table that. We'll True. review it, check it out, and then bring it up to put it on next it month. It does seem like time. common sense. Who would want anything handed to them that's that important, uh, you know, with no notice? However, I find that uh, communicating our desires in anticipation okay. of them is you're more likely to have your desires fulfilled. Yeah. And, 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 and I see it's almost a domino effect because – we charge, so we charge a $250 continuance fee when it's uh, applicant induced. <coughs> it's stacking up applications on our agenda, it's taking other people's places, staff time, right. advertising. So, and what, I think the way to handle that here in the office, in both by planning and zoning staff and, and by the commissioners is 
you know, if you choose to submit something late and we don't have, and you do not have time to review it, you don't have to consider that as, you know, um, you can say, you know, we're going to vote tonight and we don't have to, we didn't have the time to really thoroughly read through yours. However, if you would like to issue, if you would like a continuance to give us time, you can pay a two hundred and six fifty dollar con wow. continuance fee, mm -hmm. and <laughs> but you know those those are what get people to kind of snap yeah. into shape and they'll say, I'm going to start getting the plans in seven yeah. days ahead of time, so it makes the mailer. Mm -hmm. Who are you? I don't think it needs to necessarily be on this application. We can put it. We can put it on here, um, and I can go over the language with the chairman um, or or uh, Commissioner Young ahead of time before we finalize this? What we did for what it's worth is on a separate piece of paper distinct from the application checklist was message from the board. Dear applicant, <coughs> yeah. don't do this to us, don't right. do it to yourself. Exactly, that's a wonderful. Love the board. Extra <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'll send you a copy and if you find any merit to it, maybe we can Yeah, why don't you do consider. that? That'd be great. Would you all like to just add that as an amendment to what, you know, with the yeah. intent of Commissioner Young and then we can iron out the exact Wordage, absolutely, and yes. add it to these other amendments. That we sure. Have. Great. Yes. Yes. Okay. Perfect. There's also a typo. I think I said that needs to be in there. The word B. One more observation I made tonight. <coughs> you can tell me if we're getting too much in the weeds, but I don't like the handing in of photographs taken by whom I don't know, taken when I don't know. If people are going to give us photographic evidence, it's not that hard to get out the pen and write on the back of it, taken by whomever, dated on whatever date. But throwing me <coughs> photographs is like, you know, we might as well have created them in Photoshop. It means nothing without the documentation. Do we need to, do you think, get into that level of detail in the application? Any photographic evidence needs to be documented? Or do, is that common sense that no one seems yeah. to be using? I mean, if, if I've always been under the impression that if there isn't a date stamp on it, it could have been taken 15 years ago, and that's, and it doesn't matter to me. I'm, I'm not the same opinion. consider it at that point. Yet I, I frequently am handed photographs, and I don't think people have <coughs> malicious intent, but again, do, maybe they need to see it on a piece of paper. This is our expectations. I don't know. And then, I mean, where do we stop? Yeah. I it becomes very long. You gotta long. date an email, you gotta date it. I, I if mean, I may, I- I agree with you. I, I would ask the chair, perhaps, for advice. Uh, while the applicant was in the middle of his presentation, I didn't want to hand, take the photographs to him. I could see on the back they weren't marked but I felt like I couldn't not receive it, and, and I felt I couldn't interrupt him in the middle of his presentation. So I'm wondering, you know, by the time these photographs make their way to you or to Jay, is that when we hit the pause button to say, and by the way, who took these and when, while we got them here, or some path of, so we can plan ahead for next time, because it probably will happen again. Mm -hmm. I think so. I think that's how we handle it. I think if, if photographs or uh, other evidence is submitted into the record and there's something missing like a date stamp, who took it, <coughs> what time, where. Mm -hmm. I think that's that's when it's, you know, our response, the board's responsibility to get that information out of them, at least on the record. So maybe again, by the time it gets from me down to you, they'll finish their presentation, the appropriate pause to say, and please document what you just handed us. Okay. I'm done. Thank you. Okay. Um, do, we, is there, do we need a motion or a motion to put these back in the photo application? Or? We might as well vote since we've spent some time on it. Let's do that. Uh, does anybody, would anyone like to float a motion to approve the changes to the ZBA app, Zoning Board of Appeals application? So moved. Mr. Tavares, seconded by Ms. Streets. Any discussion? Uh, thank None. You. Thank all, you. All in favor, <laughs> aye. Aye. Thank you. Carried unanimously. Absolutely. Okay, other items. 2019 Zoning Board of Appeals meeting schedule. Has everyone had a chance to look at all those wonderful evenings we're gonna meet next year? Yeah. Also check to make sure it wasn't on a- I did too, night. it's a Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> I did the same thing. That was good, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm that <laughs> Yeah, we, okay. Um, so we have a motion to approve our 2019 Zoning Board of Appeals meeting schedule. So moved. By Mr. Tavares. Seconded by Ms. Young. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Approved unanimously. I, I'm not going without like saying uh, no, okay. Since our next meeting is the organizational meeting. Correct. Could you or Jay just remind us what the expectations are so we can be prepared for it? 
Sure. Um, at that point, um, the board will decide um, if, who will be the chairman and vice chairman for uh, 2019. Um, so I would come prepared to vote for that. And if there are any other changes to procedures, things like applications, kind of things where it seems like we're starting to get a, ahead on, um, any other procedural changes or bylaw changes, um, that would be the time. So would yeah. you like, I'm sorry. You'll circulate the bylaws to remind us what they say. <laughs> I'll be honest. He I don't think the Zoning Board of Appeals <laughs> has bylaws. I think we could use some. I don't think, yeah. That might be a, a, a project to work on during the administrative session going forward in 2019 if we don't have them. I've looked and I haven't been able to find them, so I'll double check. Could we copy and paste? Do you have anyone's bylaws that might be useful? Like sure. the plan we can report? request them from other towns also to see what they contain. Yeah, uh, mine are ancient. Where yeah, I'm we can from. adopt them. <laughs> well, well, we well, amended the zoning commissions uh, in January of last year. So I, as a template or as a starting point, I can show you what they've done. Do you have an opinion on term limits? Uh, not term limits, but rather, <coughs> I do know in the town I work in, the ZBA's bylaws allow for two-year terms of the officers. Are you, do you have an opinion on why it seems to be one-year terms for the world in Stratford? Stratford does things a little differently. <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, no, it's, uh, I, I have no opinion on it. Um, this seems like right when you finally get, when one gets into their groove, suddenly mm -hmm. they're up for, you know, renewal, sure. <laughs> so to speak. Sure. Yeah. I have no opinion on it either way. You know, I think it all depends on the different aspirations of the, of the, the board and, and its individual members, so. If we lost our alternate, he probably could offer an opinion as to how it evolved to where it is now. <laughs> Just curious, thank you. What time would you like to meet? Uh, <coughs> 15 minutes early, half hour early? We don't have any times here for the, uh, the organizational meeting. You wanna meet? The organizational meeting still meets, it meets at seven o'clock okay. and then our, the public hearing just starts right after yeah. this. Okay. It but should be pretty in quick. Uh, five, five, 10 yeah, minutes. Five, okay. 10 minutes more. We, um, we have one more item before, two more items before adjournment, one not on your agenda. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, sorry, before Michelle. we do that, is there any preview of people who are feeling like they want to stay in their current position or change their position? Or does no one want to go on record tonight to um, tell us about the officers? I don't think anyone wants to go on record tonight. Okay. I think we can work it out. Yes, yeah. fine. Thank you. You think I'm going to filibuster to stay here? <laughs> 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 um, Okay, uh, back to the agenda. Um, 350 Whippewell Lane has submitted an erosion and sediment control application, which falls under other items. <clears throat> and uh, Jay, I don't, I apologize, I didn't review it. Um, it what you have it here? And it was, it would, it would, like, I, like all the other parts of that application, they were sent out in, you know, July. So uh, I wouldn't blame anybody for not having them still. Needless to say, this, the erosion and sediment control Trolls. application. It's irrelevant. It's a re uh, the main application was denied. So I would just say we should make a vote to, to deny this as well. Motion to deny. Motion to deny by Ms. Young. Second. Seconded by Mr. DeVars. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Carried unanimously. <coughs> okay, the last item is 2381 Barnum Avenue. Um, Jay ca called me because uh, he received a, a letter from an attorney. They wanted to resubmit their application. This was heard in my absence, and it was for, I believe, a restaurant on Barnum Avenue that had no parking. And they, um, they have a substantial, well, I shouldn't judge. They have a, the same application. They want a restaurant, but th now they acquired some leased parking somewhere, and they considered that to be a totally new application and substantially different. I was unwilling to make an executive decision as chairman and wanted the input from the board on it, and that's why it's on the agenda. So I was present okay. and heard their testimony, and I think they're trying to be responsive to some of the concerns I raised. Therefore, this makes it a distinct application from the one we just reviewed, and therefore warrants uh, allowance to, to have them appear again, in my opinion. So I would I make them. Right. Uh, Mr. Hrabanski? I just wanted to, just to clarify, 
they haven't secured the parking, but they are now intending to send out, <coughs> they're, they're actively pursuing trying to get a parking agreement. That too is a difference from last time when they said, why should we? We haven't, we don't intend to. But now we've got a different attitude. That to me is a preferred position than the one we left, last left them with and therefore I would have no objection to having them return and would make a motion to allow them to return. Okay, so we have a motion by Ms. Young that they're allowed to return prior to the six month statutory waiting time. Second. Seconded by Mr. Tavares, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Passes unanimously. <clears throat> Before I seek a motion for adjournment, I want to, at the end of the year, thank a few people uh, for, I think, a successful year on our board. Uh, first and, and foremost, Mr. Jay Habansky, who you know, keeps us informed and is here to help us with these decisions. No gavel. Uh, Gail DeCilio, who is absent tonight. Aileen, it was nice to have you, but Gail's been unbelievable. Gail, if you ever watch the tape, thank you. And of course, all the board members, I mean, it's been, you know, it's, I think we had a good year, and I think we really try to get it right um, all the time. Uh, and uh, I think we do a good job digging in these applications and, you know, making good uh, legal decisions. So I wanted without to thank the entire party board. Without party politics. It's, it's Pardon? Without party politics. Yes. Well, that, next year's a new year, that's why. <laughs> no. <laughs> As the minority <laughs> chair here. Uh, and also, Walter, thank you for always attending our meetings, and we're glad you're healthy. <laughs> and we're glad you're here. Good to so, see you. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. And I'll, now I will attend, uh, take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. So moved by Ms. Street, second by Ms. Young. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We are adjourned. <laughs>